May 17th in Santa Ana. It so happened, by chance, I read uh, your first published story very recently in the latest Unearth magazine. And, um, from that I learned that you first started writing science fiction when you were living in San Francisco, is that right? Oh, I was living in Berkeley. Berkeley, yes. And what I often start out by asking these in these interviews, especially if I don't know the answer, is to what extent you knew what was going to happen next uh, after that first story. Did you have a list of ambitions? One, two, three, four. You're going to do this, you're going to do that. Or was it just sort of one thing at a time? As I said in the introduction and on Earth uh, in Berkeley at that time, it was the goal of everyone to be a writer. But uh, we didn't conceive of it by and large in terms of being a published writer, that is writing as a economic consideration. I mean, people wrote the way, for instance, a person writes a poem, he doesn't expect to make a living on it. That's right, you said you were, you were looked at actually as, as almost having sort of sold out in some degree. Yes, well, this really, uh, I think I exaggerated that somewhat. Uh, that wasn't the general view, but uh, it wasn't customary, it was not customary to submit one's writing after one wrote a story uh, to submit it to a magazine. And the people who read science fiction were a very distinct, small separate group of people cut off from the general Berkeley intellectual community. They had no, there was no uh, concourse between the science fiction people and the greater intellectual community, uh, cultural community surrounding the university. Uh, the, I, was in, I was in a curious position. I had read science fiction since I was 12 years old and was really addicted to reading it. I mean, I, I, I just loved it. And I also was reading what the Berkeley intellectual community was reading, which would be like Proust, for example, and Joyce. And so I occupied two worlds right there, which normally did not intersect. I remember I, I worked at a um, radio and TV sales store, and after work I'd go home and I'd read uh, Remembrance of Things Past, and really just, just for enjoyment, and I'd write little artsy stories, and writing a science fiction story was as natural to me as writing a non-science fiction story. I, in fact, in high school, I was writing, uh, working on a science fiction story, which I still have. So I have a copy of it. And I was never convinced that science fiction was of less value than, than high literature. I, to, my, my, my motivation was entirely a, a pleasure-pain motivation. I, I, I read what I read because I liked it. I was I was extremely rebellious against authority, and if something was considered a classic, I didn't read it because it was a classic. I mean, uh, I wasn't trying to read classics per se. I liked Proust. And I liked Van Vogt. I still like Proust, and I still like Van Vogt. Did you go through that sort of alienation experience that some science fiction writers? Complain about? How do you mean? Oh, the sense that uh, you were reading this stuff and they, the other people weren't, and therefore you were peculiar and you felt uh, different. And oh, I was, I was, I was, that. I was plenty peculiar and different anyway. I mean, I was, it was not a uh, much of an added burden. Um, In what ways were you peculiar? And different? Well. Um, there, I was spanning another, into another world, and quite a different world, and that is the world which shows up a lot in my novels. Uh, working in a retail store, is this bother you? <laughs> working in a retail store, the people that I knew were television salesmen and uh, television repairmen, 
and they were completely not intellectuals and they didn't read and they would always say oh, you, you should go to more ball games and read less fewer books mm -hmm. and I'd go to I, I love to go to the baseball games and uh, if I was considered peculiar by my peers my peers by and large considered me peculiar for reading at all um, I was I just spend all kinds of different uh, groups there I mean I I, uh, in, in politics, uh, I knew people of different political persuasions. I, I knew, knew a lot of homosexuals. There was a whole homosexual community in, in, in the Bay Area even then, in the 40s. And uh, the store I worked at, they, they would always, you know, they really... Would, they would the boss would call me and interrogate me? Did I know any homosexuals? And I'd always say no, I didn't know any homosexual. My friends were not gay. I mean, I never occurred to me to tell the truth. I don't see any reason why I should tell the truth. Well, I mean, I didn't see any reason then. I don't see any reason now. I didn't think it was my boss's business, but I knew some very very fine poets uh, there in the Bay Area. Poets that are really some of America's finest poets, and I was very proud of them as my friends. And um, they they wanted me to be gay, and I didn't want to be gay. So they they thought they thought I was strange because I was not gay, and the people in my store thought I was strange because I knew gay people and because I read books. So being involved in science fiction didn't really make all that much difference. It was it was a, a small matter of divergence compared to some of my other divergences. My interest, for instance, in classical music, uh, I was very very involved with classical music in high school. Now an American kid growing up in high school listening to Mahler, if you can imagine a kid in high school listening to not just even Mahler, but Mahler's lesser known works, such as the Mahler Ninth, and being an avid collector of, of n not just things like the 1812 Overture, but things like the Lied von der Erde. Um, and gracious sake, uh, what I went through in high school, uh, listening to something like the, the Beethoven's Misa Solemnis as a, as a high school student, uh, it's like Henry Miller said in, in one of the Tropics books about his childhood, that he was stoned by other, other children, threw stones at him when they saw him, you know, I had that same feeling, you know, that, that I, I, they threw stones at me when they saw me. The, the other kids did, the people that I, I worked for and with at the store, um, the gay people because I wasn't gay, the, my communist friends because I wouldn't join the communist party. I, I was terribly attacked once by a, a communist girl that I knew uh, came up to me at, at Larry Blake's, in one of the most famous uh, restaurants in Berkeley, and dropped her cigarette in my cup of coffee. This was an extremely provocative political act. <laughs> in Berkeley is to drop a lighted cigarette in somebody's coffee cup at Larry Blake's. In in plain sight of the, the uh, creme de la creme of the Berkeley political community, which used to always gather at Larry Blake's, to show her utter loathing for me because mm -hmm. she had discovered that one of my closest friends was a Trotskyist. And, you know, I, I managed to become universally despised wherever I went. I, I, um, I think that I must have thrived on it because um, it kept happening so many times in, in so many ways. I, this really bore fruit when I went to the University of California and I had mandatory ROTC. You know. Oh, God. Uh, and they gave me an M1 rifle to, to field strip and um, handing me a rifle to field strip. I was, I was raised in Quaker schools. I was raised as a Quaker. And they're about the only group in the world that I don't have some grievance against, you know, or some, some, some there's no hassle between me and the Quakers. And I took the damn thing apart, and I honestly tried to put it back together. I really tried. Let the record show that I tried to assemble my M M1, but I put the trigger in first instead of last, and it fell down into the damn breach. 
and it's probably still there. And I had to go and tell the sergeant that I could not put my M1 together out of a class of a thousand. I was the only one who couldn't instantly put together an M1 rifle. And I was told to leave the university Uh, the whole university? I was, well, what happened was, see, you had to have a, you not only had to take ROTC, you had to get a passing grade. Mm -hmm. And I was like a character in one of those novels by England's Angry Young Man right after the war. Mm -hmm. They'd say, they'd call me to my feet in ROTC class and they'd say, what is the difference between a rank and a file? And I'd say, a rank, sir, is longer and a file, sir, is shorter. So anyway, I was calling the dean's office, and it was pointed out that in philosophy, for instance, I had an A, and in ROTC, I had less than an F. I actually had more demerits than merits. That if we were asked to appear on the parade ground in uniform, I appeared without my uniform in my civilian clothes, and if it was the other way around, then I appeared the other way around. And if we were required to appear with our jackets, I did not have mine, and vice versa. And they asked me why this was, because if I did not pass ROTC, I had to leave university. And I said, my reasons are moral. And they said, then get out of this university and don't ever come back. And I, I, I did. And I left and I never came back. And I, I, you know, it would be really wonderful if I could say that I did it out of some lofty idealistic motive to protest war. But I just couldn't put that damn rifle back together. And I could not understand things like creeping through the bushes and falling on some unsuspecting prey and other military tactics that were regarded as highly important. But I could go into history class and I could go into philosophy class and I could argue coherently in those subjects. Mm -hmm. But I could not grasp what was being required of me in ROTC. And I think a great deal of my rebellious attitude really stems from a, a simple inability to understand what's being asked of me. It, uh, it, I had the same problem in geometry class in high school. Now, there's no political matter. There's no ideology involved in geometry. And uh, I would be asked to get up to the blackboard and perform you know, one of those things that they do in geometry a name I can't understand a theorem or something like that and I wouldn't be able to do it and then they would yell at me and I have this image of this figure yelling at me no one has ever trisected the angle in 4,000 years and you're not going to be able to trisect the angle now get away from that blackboard for God's sake and I would continue on trying to try the angle and would, would wind up. I wound up in, in, in my, my grade in, in geometry on my final exam was F minus because all I was able to do was write my name on the paper. I wasn't even able to draw the figure that we had to do the theorem about. I couldn't even draw it. Okay. So you see underlying my stance against the establishment, my anti-war stance, my, my left-wing politics, and everything else is a simple inability to understand orders. If orders are given to me, I try desperately to obey them and am unable as a result to even go through the simplest routine if, if I'm ordered to do it. It sounds like the good corporal swipe, doesn't it? It sounds like my unconscious is really revolting against the act the act of being given an order because I associate the whole thing with somebody saying you will you will do the following and I think I think there really is in me a, a real animosity toward being told what to do and it comes up in the form of, a, of an incredible ineptness in carrying out orders like, uh, you know, if the state of California sends me something to stick onto my license plate to show that my car is registered, and it says, stick this in the upper right-hand corner, 
I will run down frantically to put it immediately on my car and immediately stick it on the bottom left-hand corner of the license plate. I mean, I'll just do it. And I have to stop myself and slow myself down and, and remind myself that uh, it probably would be better if I thought the matter through before <laughs> putting it on the bottom left-hand corner. Were you writing the uh, the early short stories after college? I'm trying to get some sort of chronology here. Well, I started writing in high school. Um, I wrote, let's see, I went from high school to a full time job, a six day a week job at the, at the uh, well, I also had between a record store and a radio shop. Mm -hmm. And um, working six days a week, I didn't get a chance to do much writing. I got married when I was 19, and um, it wasn't until a little later that I really began to write. Um, I got married again when I was 21. I got divorced and married again. And I... Um, I suddenly began, a point came when I suddenly began to feel that science fiction was very important. I, I had... What, what, which books gave you this particular... Um, yeah, Van Vogt's World of Noe. There was something about that that absolutely fascinated me. The spirit of it or the logic of it? Well, I took it for granted that there was a logic in that book. Mm. Now, I don't know. They... They did some awfully strange things in that book. Uh, it, to me, it had a mysterious quality. It, it alluded to things unseen, you know, a metaphysical sort of thing. That, that uh, there were puzzles presented which were never adequately explained. And other people found this irritating, whereas I found it mm -hmm. a numinous quality. And... Uh, I read it when it came out in Astounding, and then I read read it again when uh, Simon Schuster published it in Hardback. And I began to get an idea of a mysterious quality in the universe which could be dealt with in science fiction, and which um, was neither fantasy, wasn't fantasy. I realize now that what I was sensing was a kind of a, a metaphysical world, you know, an invisible realm uh, of things half seen uh, with supernatural powers. And, uh, it was essentially what, what the medieval people sensed as the uh, transcendent world, the world of the next world, the upper realm. And that, without knowing it, I was really getting into almost... Well, not almost. I, actually, I was getting into uh, what John W. Campbell called psionics, and what, what was really for me was theology. Was It was a dormant religious sense on my part. I mean, When you say dormant, this is one thing I wanted to ask you about, actually. Did you have a, a religious background other than the, the Quaker schooling? No, none at all. They didn't give us any religious training at all. Uh, and I went to a Quaker school myself, so I know they're, they're very kind of low-key about it. Yeah. No, I had no religious uh, background. The Quaker thing was more just a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And um, in Berkeley, I mean, we there was no religious spirit at all. And I was mixed up in left-wing politics, and um, nobody even debated the existence of God. Mm -hmm. God was never, never mm -hmm. discussed. And um, I was feeling uh, what I recognize now to be uh, vague, religious strivings and a vague sense of the numinous world and resonating to Van Vogt. I don't know if Van Vogt would agree that he's essentially dealing with the supernatural, but um, that's what was happening in me. And I began to formulate ideas. Brunner, John Brunner put it very well in his introduction to my best of uh, the Valentine edition, that, that my real preoccupation is the difference between our perception of reality and reality itself. I was beginning to sense that, that what we perceived was not what was actually there. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Do you know what prompted this? Yes, it was an experience I had in high school with my um, geometry teacher. <laughs> I was looking at her one day, and she was rattling away in this high-pitched, clackety-clack, shrill voice. And suddenly I had the impression that she was not a human being, but a mechanical creature, and that all of a sudden uh, her head would fall off and the spring would be visible. And the more I thought about it, the more it seemed quite likely that this was the case. And once the idea got into my mind, I couldn't get rid of it, that this creature who was constantly yammering at us all was just simply not, not really alive. It was just not really like us. And, and that's what started it all. Hmm. So then, after Van Vogt you know, and, and sort of the gradual development of this notion that there were other things than everyday reality as most people perceived it. Is that a fair? Uh, I, ha I had read a lot of psychology. I read a lot of Jung, and I was interested in Jung's idea of projection, and that is that a lot of what we experience as external to us is really projected from our unconscious. Mm. And that meant, of course, that each person's world had to be somewhat different than everybody else's because the contents of his unconscious would be, uh, to a certain extent, unique. And I began a series of stories in which people experienced worlds which were projections of their own psyches. And I was doing this when I first began to sell, uh, like Rug, my first story, is, an, is a perfect example of what I was trying to do, where uh, the dog sees the world completely different from mm -hmm. the way human beings see the world. And... It, although it's a fantasy, it was related to a very large number of stories that I wrote which were not precisely fantasies and were simply not marketable because they were neither fantasies, they had no fantasy premise, nor were they realistic. And what I called them was interior projection stories. And I tried to explain, I already had, uh, by that time I had Scott Meredith as my agent, and he couldn't sell them and didn't want to handle them. And I tried to explain what what I was trying to do, and that was I was showing each person with a, a different world and the contents of that world consisting to a large degree of material from his own mind, which came back at him from outside, and which he did not recognize as his own mind coming back at him from outside. Now, this is, this is an idea that has never, never left me, that a good deal of what each of us experiences is a projection of his unconscious, and it's not, as, as I say, it's, it was Jung's idea, not mine. And um, it, it, it's an idea that grew stronger in me rather than weaker, but uh, I had to abandon eventually writing everything except science fiction and fantasy, because although I wrote 11 novels and many short stories, which were not science fiction or fantasy, they all contained the element of the projected personal unconscious or projected collective unconscious and were simply incomprehensible to, to, to anyone who read them because they, it would require you to accept my premise, which essentially was that each of us lives in, in a unique world, which, as you know, I use an eye in the sky. Sure. That, that was where I first used it in a published work. But, uh, but before I in the Sky, there were many novels that I wrote that were never published, in which uh, the world assumed a uh, personal character like that, a, a pseudo-world. It must have been extremely, frust well, extremely frustrating, as I understand, to have, have done all this work and not be able to sell it, not be able to make it understandable to other people? Well, it, it, it really was. I mean, I, I, I almost sold one. Uh, I'd get to the point where I, a publisher would notify me they were drawing up a contract even, but it, it never happened. Uh, nobody would ever go on. Uh, nobody, nobody would carry it through to, to a point of offering me a contract. Um, but these, these novels, presumably, are still unsold? That's correct. Not all of them exist, but a number of the manuscripts were lost.
there was, I think there's something like nine or ten um, novel-like manuscripts extant over at the Fortin Special Collections. Uh, over what? Um, there's about nine or ten manuscripts of, yes. of these novels over at the Fullerton Special Collections Library. Oh, the Fullerton, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, one was published, you know, Confession of a Crap Artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, um, I always thought that was the best one, so when that was published, uh, I, I didn't feel so bad. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that took the sting out of it, but it did take, as Paul Williams said, took 19 years to publish yeah. it. Do you feel, generally speaking, that uh, you haven't been entirely fairly treated by the publishing world? Oh, no, I don't feel that at all. Um, I was delighted to sell my first story, and uh, I, I mean, I, no, no, not at all. I, I don't feel that. Uh, I, um, I mean, it's been a long road, um, um, but... Uh, Science fiction offered me a road in which I could, a route by which I could publish the kind of thing that I wanted to write. Uh, this I, I was reading Martian Time Slip the other night. Now that is exactly what I wanted to write. Uh, the invasion of one person's world by another person's world. I, as I was reading it, I was thinking, you know, you know, this is really strange stuff indeed. But this is definitely what I had wanted to do from the very beginning. Uh, the way the autistic boy's world takes over, uh, say, Arnie Cott, takes over Jack Bowen and so on. That I, I did get into print in, say, Martian Time Slip and a number of books. Um, the, this, the, the, the premise, which was to me so important, and that is the, not just that we live, each of us, in a somewhat unique world of our own psychological contents, but that the subjective world of, a, of, a, of one rather powerful person can infringe on the world of another person. Mm. I mean, this, 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 uh, this is something that I began to see, uh, uh, ramifications of politically and um, psychologically where um, people can exert a, do a domineering power over others. I mean, if I can make you see <clears throat> the world the way I see it, then you will automatically think the way I think. You will come to the conclusions I come to. If, if, if I can control your perception and that the, 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 the greatest power that a human being can exert over others is to get control of their perceptions of reality and, and essentially infringe on the integrity and individuality of their world. And this is done in politics and this is done, in, uh, this is done for instance in, in psychotherapy, which, which um, uh, I mean, I, I've, I've, I remember there was one therapist, one, one psychiatrist I went to, um, uh, he informed me that I was an alcoholic. Um, and I said, uh, no, no, no. I, I said, no, no, I, I, I'm not an alcoholic. I don't drink. As a matter of fact, I... And he... Now, now I knew I didn't drink. And I, he would occasionally say things like, well, you look... Like you're feeling pretty good. I guess you hit every bar in town, didn't you? Since I've seen you less. And I, 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 now I found myself, this man was so domineering that I realized how, of course, being from the left wing, you know, I would use the word fascist. I mean, this is our, the ultimate pejorative term by the left. Authoritarian is perhaps more accurate there. But it does verge on totalitarianism. Um, his view of me was that I was a, an a oral addictive type. Now, perhaps that is correct. But I had had pancreatitis at one time. And uh, this means that I, I can't really drink. I mean, no one who's had pancreatitis can ever really drink. 
And I'd never really drunk anyway. And I didn't get pancreatitis from drinking. I got it from bad street dope. Mm -hmm. And uh, it had a film uh, developer in it. Almost killed me. So one time I finally said to him, I said, look, I used to be a drug addict. And I got street dope and had film developer in it and it ate my pancreas. It damaged my liver. You know, it, it fucked up. My, it caused total kidney shutdown. Total, absolute, 100% kidney shutdown. I almost died. And I said, if I would tell you this, wouldn't I tell you if I drank? <laughs> Good Lord. These were, these were fake Mexican Benny cartwheels marketed by the Hells Angels, and they were poison. He says, well, I may, he says, I, I remain cynical. Now, now, here is an example of this man. Now, now you see, I could, just, I could just imagine a situation. You see, this, this is something that I dealt with in uh, Man Who Japed. Where you get uh, a futuristic apartment building, and I got this idea of reading about uh, People's China. You get all the uh, all the people living in your building, and you all get together every every three days, and everybody in the building tells you what's right and what's wrong, and they, you know you get up and you confess your shortcomings, and this is now called attack therapy, and I went through attack therapy in Canada at a uh, drug rehab place I was at, although I wasn't there for drug rehabilitation. But you get a lot of people all yelling at you, <laughs> you're an alcoholic. And all of a sudden, the mystery of the, of the Moscow purge trials of the 30s becomes <laughs> very clear as to how a person could, could confess to a crime he couldn't possibly have committed. And, you know, get up and say, in the most sincere manner, that he has committed a crime, the penalty for which is execution, and he is pleading with the court to believe that he committed this crime. Now, if he convinces the court that he's committed this crime, they're going to kill him. Why is this man trying to convince the court that he's committed a crime, which is an absurd crime, in the sense that it's impossible he could have committed it? Now, how did this man ever come to this point in his life where he is pleading with them to believe that he committed this crime? Well... This is the incredible power of one or, or a group of human beings to dominate the personal world of another, of another human being and actually to, to, to damage the contours of his psyche in such a way that the contents of their collective psyche invade his, invade his world and determine his image of himself, that he can actually be believed their view of him. I remember in attack therapy looking around. Was, I, I noticed it better with, with somebody else. There was this one guy there. And um, he was dressed up kind of Natalie. And he was, he was uh, French. And they said, you look like a homosexual. Well, within half an hour, they had him convinced that he was a homosexual. <laughs> he started crying. <laughs> In shame. I thought, you know, this is very strange because, you know, I know this guy is not homosexual. And yet he's crying and, you know, he, he, he's admitting to this thing. Now, he's not admitting to this thing in order to cause the abuse to stop. And the, the, the screams of these, these, these people who turned into demons were all yelling at him, you fairy, you fruit, you homo, you. Admit what you are. I mean, he, because by confessing to it, he didn't cause them to stop. He simply caused them to yell louder and say, we were right, we were right. He was beginning to agree with them. And, and I, so one time I was, I was put on the hot seat, as we called it. And uh, my old political days came back to me. And I rebounded with a with a thrust of fury at at the managing uh, director of the entire foundation of the entire organization that was there at that time and i just my all my old political you know, fighting instincts came out and i finally had him admitting that saying to me, you have no right to criticize this because you don't know enough. In other words, he was saying, in essence, you see, that uh, it was an authoritarian thing. And it was, I mean, he was copying to the fact that uh, you will do what we say, and you will do it without understanding. You do not know enough to criticize. You do not know enough to, to, to rebuke me. 
And I felt I had become part of a small totalitarian community, you see, in which uh, no one-to-one -one relationships were permitted, no private conversations were permitted. <clears throat> People were encouraged to uh, narc on one another, you know, report. They, mm -hmm. they would report at the meetings that so-and-so had said such and such, had been overheard saying such and such and so on. And all this can be viewed politically and all this can be viewed psychologically. And to me, it was all viewed dramatically in my writing, in the, the, the eerie and uncanny invasion of one person's world by another person's world. That if I invade your world, you will probably sense something alien entering your world because my world is different from yours. And if you're if you're strong, you will fight it. You must you must of course fight it. I mean, you should fight it. Um, but we don't because a lot of it is subtle, and we just have intimations that our worlds are being invaded. We don't know where where this in, you know invasion of our personal integrity is coming from. It comes from authority figures in general. I mean, by, you know, by definition, anyone who can impinge on your world and deform it and insert into it their value systems and their, their view of you is an authority figure. That's how we define authority figures. And, and is, is, a, is a menace to, to, your, to your psychological and moral integrity. Mm. Do, you, do you feel that any of your books are, uh, in any sense, warnings against this? I mean, to what extent are you commenting on this and to what extent are you writing it with a specific idea of, of getting a reaction from the reader. In other words, how, to what extent are you aware of the reader at all? When you... Oh, I'm very conscious of the reader. I mean, I, I am saying to the reader, the greatest menace that faces the human being in the 20th century is the coming into existence in our times of the totalitarian state which can take many forms. It can take the form of, uh, doesn't have to take the form of, of right-wing fascism. It can take the form of left-wing fascism. It can take the form of psychological movements. It can take the form of religious movements. I mean, it can be asked, or it can be the Hare Krishna people. It can be Sinanon, drug rehabilitation places. It can be powerful people, it, it, uh, manipulatory people, manipulative people. Um, it can be in a relationship where you're in a relationship with someone who is more powerful than you psychologically. Um, and essentially, I'm, I'm pleading the cause of those people who are not strong. I mean, I, I identify myself as essentially a weak person, a person who succumbs to authority and can only fight a rear guard defensive action against it, essentially a losing battle against it. That uh, all I, I mean, if I were, if I were strong, if I were a strong person psychologically, I would not feel this as such a menace, probably. I mean, this is probably an indication of my own uh, vulnerability to, to uh, my, the fragility of my own ego, my own, my own self system. Uh, this one psychiatrist who insisted that I was not calling, bullied me and bullied me and bullied me. And instead of fighting back, I just simply stopped going to it. Now, now, it would have been much better if I had confronted him head on. It would have been a sign of strength. It was not a sign of strength for me to stop going. It was, it, it was a chicken shit thing to do, to just stop going. And I, I think, you know, that, that I can speak for the people who are not powerfully armored against authoritarian and the authority figures and authoritarian uh, groups and, and movements, states, blocks, and so on, that I speak for all the people who get victimized because they are essentially weak and do not have tactics of direct defense and, and who, are, who are really ripped off psychologically and this is one reason why my protagonists are, are essentially what, what, what's called anti-heroes. Uh, they're, they're almost losers in a way, you know, and yet, you know, I, I try to 
equip them with certain qualities by which they can survive. But I'm equipping people to survive who are not in charge of the situation. I mean, they're people who are essentially victims of the situation and, and victims through, through weakness, uh, not victims through the malice of other people, but victims through their own weakness. And a, a corollary on this is that I don't want to see them develop counter-aggressive tactics where, where they essentially become exploitive and manipulative and uh, develop, uh, like I took some assertion training, and, you know, we were taught tactics of assertion. Mm-hmm. And, and these were just counter-fascist tactics. Absolutely. I mean, you, you just, all you did was you learned, you learned techniques by which you bullied other people. And so you then sallied forth into the world as, as another bully, and it was it was bully against bully. So it was just it was it became a, a, a jungle where, where it was just whoever possessed the, the, the technique which was the most ruthless, the most selfish, the most cruel, the most heartless. I mean, we were taught to turn off our feelings. We were taught to to strike out. You know, to be to be impervious to other people's needs. And I, I object to that very strongly. It reminds me of that book, When I Say No, I Feel Guilty, and uh, books like that. Which, yeah, that. Does, does, does all of this, I mean, this all sounds very reasonable to me. I, I get the suspicion that at times you people must have said, ah, you're paranoid. Um, and I wonder what your reaction is to that. Uh, I was told I was paranoid before my house was 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 hit. That I was paranoid thinking was going to be hit. I remember when I opened the door and found nothing but ruins everywhere, and windows and doors smashed in, my files blown open, every all my papers missing, all my canceled checks gone, my stereo gone. I remember thinking, well, it sure is a hell of a mess. But there there goes that theory. <laughs> no, I know I, I was told by a fairly good analyst that. I'm, I'm not cold-blooded enough to be paranoid. I'm, I'm, he said once that I was too sentimental to be paranoid. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you're, "He said to me, you're, you're, you're melodramatic and you're full of illusions about life, but he said you're too sentimental to be paranoid." I have to turn my tape in. Okay. I've got a 90-minute one. what are called technically paranoid anxieties. Um, would you say it was paranoid if you were afraid that your your battery was dead in your car? <laughs> I have a terrible fear that my battery is going to be dead or I'll have a flat tire when I get down to the basement to start up my car. Um, now, uh, I took the Minnesota multiphasic once and was that a, a psychological profile test? Mm-hmm. And I tested out as paranoid, cyclothymic, neurotic, uh, schizophrenic. And not only that, I tested out high on the K scale, which is the scale for lying. <laughs> I tested out as an, inc- an incorrigible liar. And the person who was giving me the test was a friend of mine who was doing it for the Army as, a, as his career in the Army. And I was so high on some of the scales that I, the, the dot was up in the instructions part. <laughs> I couldn't even find the dot. And then he got to the K scale, and he said, you're a malingerer. I says, you know, I says, I'm 4F. I, I, I don't have to malinger. I mean, I've got high blood pressure. I'm not, you're not, you're not, in a, you're, at this moment, you are not in a position of examining an inductee. So why would I malinger? Well, the K scale is consistency. They'll say, uh, I'll give you the question phrased several different ways. And they'd ask, uh, um, answer yes, maybe, or no. Uh, I think there is a divine deity that rules the world. I'd say, yeah, there probably is. And then later on they'd say, um, I don't think there is a divine deity that rules the world. I'd say, that's probably correct. <laughs> I can see a lot of reasons for thinking that. So I'd mark, yes, yeah, there is no divine deity. And later they'd say, I'm not sure if there's a divine deity that rules the world. I'd say, yeah, that's about right. Uh, and, and now, uh, in every case I was sincere. Now, he couldn't believe that I was sincere. 
And uh, I've, I, I think that philosophically I, I fit in with some of the very uh, late pre-Socratic people around the time of uh, Zeno and Diogenes. Um, you know, the cynics in, in the Greek sense, you know, those that live like dogs <laughs> in burial urns, not in the modern sense of the word, that um, I am inevitably persuaded by every argument that is brought to bear. <laughs> <laughs> if somebody was to suggest to me that we go out for, if you were to suggest to me at this moment that we go out for Chinese food, I would immediately agree that that was the best idea I'd ever heard. In fact, I would, I would immediately say, but you've got to let me pay for it. <laughs> Or if you were to say suddenly, don't you think that Chinese food is overpriced and has very little nourishment in it, and you have to go a long way to get it, I mean, and you have to wait for a long time. When you get home, it's cold. <laughs> I said, you're right. I can't abide this stuff. And, and I mean, like, you would have created a vision, you see, for me, of this long drive and this long wait, and coming home and these cardboard cartons and spooning this stuff. If you were to say, oh, and it's so sweet, they use sugar and everything, and that's really bad for you. I have visions of very sweet, sticky sauces, and I would think, oh, that sounds terrible. He's quite right. <laughs> this is a sign of a very weak ego, I guess, you see. But, um, well, there's something more than that going on there. Uh, there's also uh, a, a willingness to believe and, and a refusal to accept the fact that they can only be one answer to any question. Well, all right. Let's, let's, I mean, let's, just in the abstract, whether or not it's being imposed on you. If, if you if you heard two people discussing, you could probably identify with both sides. Of the well, now, if my view that each person inhabits a unique world is is correct, if you say Chinese food is good, in your world it's good, and if someone else says it's bad, in his world it's bad. Now, I'm a complete relativist then in that respect, that... For me, the answer to the question is Chinese food good or bad is a meaning. It's meaningless. It's it's it's, it's exactly like the question is Beethoven's uh, Fifth Symphony a good symphony? Uh, to me, this is semantically meaningless. Mm -hmm. If if I like Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, it's a good symphony. If you do not like it, it is for you not a good symphony. To me, this is so obvious mm -hmm. that I can't get into the space of people who will actually argue the merits of a work of art. Mm -hmm. Now. This is my view, and if your view is that this is view is incorrect, you may be right, in which case I would be willing to agree with you. But my view is de gustibus non disputan the mass. Mm -hmm. um, where, where do, um, I'm sure a lot of people who've read your books uh, think to themselves, ah, it's all acid head, it's all come from drugs. But obviously... You were putting together this relativistic view of the world before you played around with this chemicals. Am I wrong? You would have to posit that I brilliantly managed to synthesize LSD twenty exactly. in yes. the forties. <laughs> <laughs> in the mid forties. Well, we haven't in, mentioned in any dates. So I wasn't yard. exactly sure where I was, but I, I seem to me that yeah, you know, many years before Hoffman synthesized it, uh, that that I had stumbled onto it. Um, my views were very, very fully formulated before I even. Uh, well, for instance, take the, my book, The Three Stigmata of Palmer Ellerich, which of course is yeah. is. is classic LSD novel, that all I had to go on was an article by Aldous Huxley about LSD. And uh, I just thought, gee, what, what, a, what a great idea. Private worlds. I knew about that already. I mean, I was quite, quite ready to admit that there were private worlds. Um, I was reading Time Out of Joint, which I wrote in the 50s, which... I mean, I know LSD now had been, uh, Hoffman had found it, working at Sandoz, he had found it, but uh, I had never heard of it, of course, then. And I was reading time on the joint, and a guy walks up to the lemonade stand, you know, at the park, and it turns into a slip of paper marked soft drink stand. And he puts the slip of paper in his pocket. I thought, 
far fucking out spacey. And I thought, that's an acid experience. Now, if I didn't know any better, I'd say this person had had turned on many times and his world was dissolving. Mm-hmm. And you can date when these books were written, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and we had never heard of LSD. Right. You know, and, and yet, you know, I read, I read, Time on a I read Time on a I says, "Oh my God, <laughs> this is terrible." This lemonade. The guy goes up to buy him and his girl a bottle of Coke apiece, a Coca Cola. All he's going to do is buy two Cokes. He's going to say, "Then I like two Cokes, two Coca Colas." And what happens? The thing turns into a piece of paper. The whole goddamn concession turns into a piece of paper. Well, I was I was hiding under the bed after I read that. I, I says, "This this." This man's universe is, is just coming un, unglued. I mean, it's 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 a fake universe. He's li- obviously living in a fake universe. Now, in in those days, the only way I could explain it in the book, I didn't read to the end because I knew you know the end was no good. Where it turns out there's a war and everything like that, and he's being duped, and he's also nuts. And then when LSD came along, you see what I was trying to do was I was trying to account for the diversity of worlds that people live in. Uh, I had not read Heraclitus then. I didn't know Heraclitus' concept of the idios cosmos, the private world, versus the koinos cosmos, which we all share. That I didn't know that the pre-Socratics had begun to discern these things. Uh, but there's more to it than that, than just private worlds. In reading Time Out of Joint, for example, when he walks up to the to the lemonade to, to the to the soft drink stand and turns into a piece of paper, you don't just have a private world. Because presumably that soft drink stand is there for anybody who wants to come up and buy a soft drink stand. It it should not turn into a slip of paper. Now I read it over. And I said, Now how did I ever come up? up with an idea like that and then I remember there's that scene where he goes in the bathroom and he's in the dark he's reaching around for the light cord and he reaches and reaches for you know for a cord hanging down suddenly he realizes there is no cord hanging down it's a switch on a wall and he says to himself well when did I ever reach for a cord hanging down in a bathroom and he can't remember well now that actually happened to me and that was what caused me to write the book I walked into my own bathroom in my own house which I own groped around the dark, up in the air for a cord, and finally realized that there had been no cord ever. There, and I couldn't remember any time in my life when I'd reached for a cord. Now, I assumed that it was a subcortical reflex, atavistic, probably from childhood, when in the old days there had been light cords rather than light switches. But it gave me the idea, or rather it gave me thought, of, of idea that Van Vogt had dealt with of, of artificial memory, such as occurs in the world of mm-hmm. L.A., where a person has false memories. Well, false memories is just what I love to think about, because false memories and false worlds are just two two you know prongs of a single fork. That uh, this all goes back to the influence that Van Vogt had on me, you see. A lot of what I wrote about is, is and that looks like it was the result of acid. It's really the result of taking Van Vogt very seriously. <laughs> and what other people regard as flaws in Van Vogt's plotting, you know, where they say, well, this doesn't make sure. sense. I I believe Van Vogt. <laughs> he wrote it, you know. I mean, he was an authority figure. And, you know, and like when Dr. Schwartz said, you, you, you sure drink a lot. And I says, I, I, I do. You know, and I was, you know, on the verge of believing Dr. Schwartz. Well, I really believe Van Vogt. If Van Vogt said, you know, that people could be somebody else and who they remembered themselves as being. Uh, I just found this fascinating. I mean, mm-hmm. you, you know, you have a complete gullibility on my, on my part, you know, a suspension of disbelief. You know, I'm mm-hmm. a massive suspension of disbelief on my part. But I love the mysterious. I love the, I love the puzzle. I, you know, I, I love a puzzle. Uh, a, 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 a a inscrutable puzzle that you can pick up and t- you, you know I don't, I'm not talking about physical puzzles no. I mean mental puzzles you know how can this be that a man can walk up to a little soft drink stand and turn a slip of paper 
I love to pose it, you know, pose the most impossible thing and not really with, with having a solution in mind. How did, did drugs affect your writing at all when you actually started experimenting with them? Or really, was it peripheral to serious work of writing? The only, the only drugs that I took regularly were amphetamines, and that was in order to be able to write as much as I had to write to make a living. Mm -hmm. I was being paid so little per book mm -hmm. that I had to turn out a very large number of books. I turned out, I think, I published 16 novels in five years mm -hmm. at one point, and I, was, I, I had an extremely expensive wife, uh, extremely expensive children. I mean, she bought a Jaguar, you know, we had a five-bedroom, three-bathroom house on 10 acres of land, and she would see a new car that she liked the looks of and just pull off and buy it. And under California law, I was legally bound by her debts. And uh, I just wrote like mad, and the only way I could write that much, I mean, I did 60 finished pages a day, mm -hmm. was to take amphetamines, and these were prescribed for me. Mm -hmm. And... I mean, you just cannot turn out that much copy, you know, unless you, I mean, I, I, at least I couldn't. And uh, <clears throat> I finally stopped taking them, and I don't write as much as I used to, but uh, I don't think it's changed the material. I, no, I don't. I, I think, you know, the three stigmata shows that, that well, uh, you know, the, the, the well, th this is not this is not something that I used to say in the '60s when when drug taking was more popular. Like I used to kind of talk like I I I was really into acid, but the, the fact of the matter is I took acid two times. <laughs> <laughs> and the second time it was so weak a dose that it was that I smoked hash was stronger. I'm not, it may not even have been acid. <laughs> I only know of one time where I really took acid. That was Sandoz acid. That was a giant horse capsule that I got from the University of California. Mm -hmm. And a friend and I split it. And I don't know, there must have been a whole milligram of it there. I mean, the gigantic thing, you know. We, we bought it for $5 and took it home. <laughs> we looked at it for a while. We looked at it for a while and we split it up. And took that. And it was just, it was the greatest thing, I'll tell you. It was, I went straight to hell, was what happened. I found myself, you know, the landscape froze over, and there were huge boulders, and there was a deep thumbing, and it was it was the day of wrath, and God was judging me as, as, a, as, a, as a sinner, and this lasted for thousands of years, and it didn't get any better. <laughs> it just got worse and worse, and I was in terrible pain. I felt terrible physical pain, and I, all I could talk was in Latin. <laughs> most embarrassing because the girl I was with thought I was doing it to annoy her and I kept saying libera, libera me domine in die illa <laughs> and on agnes de quitos peccata mundi in their barman a little German throw in their barman my god you know? and, and especially uh, Trump tremens fact, factus sum ego et time or time, you know, I'm afraid and I, you know, it's a libra me domine, and whining, whining like some poor dog that's been left out in the rain all night. And finally, just the girl with me said, "Oh, barf," and walked out of the room in disgust. And it, 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 it was, it was a little bit like when I rolled my VW. I mean, it was all very messy and. and and strange and the only good part of it was when I looked in the refrigerator um, and I hadn't defrosted the refrigerator for a long time and there was nothing in the freezer compartment I looked in I saw this giant cavern of selectites and stalagmites and I thought it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen <laughs> ashtray with cigarette butts in it <laughs> <laughs> the most horrible smell I'd ever smelled. But the mu music sounded very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And about a month later, I got the galley for the three stick matter to read over. And I started reading the galleys, and I thought, oh dear, I just can't read these galleys. They're too scary. 
because all the horrible things that I had written about in Three Stigmata seemed to be, t you know, have come true under acid. Mm. But so I was, you know, I used to warn people then. I was 64, and I used to warn people against taking it. I'd, I'd beg people not to take it. Mm. Uh, in fact, there was one girl. I, I, um, she, she came over one night. And she had a tablet of acid. Was going to take it, and. I, I begged her not to take it, and I made a, a, an amateur Rorschach blot before she, you know, she took it. And I said, I want you to look at this blot and tell me what it looks like. And she said, I see an evil shape coming to kill me. I said, you'd be a damn fool to take acid. She said that before she yes, took it. Yes, she took it. Said that before she took it. I said, please don't take the acid. Please. I, I mean, I, I just, we didn't know anything about flashbacks. We didn't know anything like that then. And I just begged her. And, well, she, well, she didn't take it. She, she did not take it, but she took it later, and she tried to kill herself and was hospitalized and became permanently psychotic. And um, I saw her um, in 1970, and uh, her mind was gone. She was not, she was, you know, uh, it, it destroyed her. And she said, she said it was the, taking the acid had destroyed her. And um, she's on that list at the end of Scanner. And I saw that in 64. I mean, I, I, when I took it, I could see what... Mm. So I can't say I had a good trip. But, you know, like, I was reading in a, in a French edition of my stuff recently that after they read Scanner, they said, well, he exploited the drug use as a, as a commercial thing for to sell mm. his writing. And... Um, I thought, well, that's not really true. <laughs> Certainly not at all. Uh, but on the other hand, I think I was more curious about drugs than anything else. You know, I mean, I've seen cats because I'm a, I always have a cat or two around, and I, if something startles a cat, some, something strange happens, a cat will become curious about it. And that's the way I felt about drugs, mm -hmm. is that, uh, like, I, I regard them as, as dangerous and, and potentially lethal, <clears throat> but I had a cat's curiosity about them. I mean, I, I really, um, I think it was an unwise curiosity. I think, I think that in general it's an unwise curiosity, mm -hmm. but, uh, I had a tremendous curiosity, and, and because I had such a curiosity about the human mind, I mean, it, it, was, it was my interest in the human mind that made me curious about psychotropic drugs. I mean, uh, I felt from reading so much Jung that the mind was a tremendous mystery, and I was very interested in this concept of the collective unconscious and, and you know, the archetypes. And... Uh, I, again, these were essentially religious strivings that were appearing in me. You know, now now they were appearing in the, in the early '60s. Uh, that shows up in Three Stigmata. Mm -hmm. By then, I had become an adult convert to the Episcopal Church, and I was becoming overtly, you know, consciously curious about religion and interested in religion. What what are you still in that church now? Do you well, I am technically, but I don't ever go down there. Mm -hmm. I mean. Um, what what actually made you decide to become a convert? My wife said if I didn't, she'd bust my nose. <laughs> was that it? And nothing else? That, that, that was it. She Rude. said. She <laughs> says, look, look. If we're going to know judges and district attorneys and important people, we have to be Episcopalians. <laughs> and she says, you want your nose busted? <laughs> okay. So I says, yes, ma'am. I says, I, I'll try to save the angle, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll stand here at the blackboard until I can try to save the angle. See, if I had been told to try to save the angle, I'd, I'd be trying to do it yet. But, so, but, but you said you had religious strivings anyway. Right? Well, I did because I was walking along one day, and I looked up in the sky, and there was this face looking down at me, a giant face with slotted eyes, the face I described in Three Stick Matter. Mm. When, and it was, when was this? Well, this was uh, in 63 or so. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a little shack that I worked in that I would go to work at every day. And uh, there was this thing looking down at me. 
wasn't really there. I mean, like, I didn't really see it, but it was there. It's like when John Bellucci on <laughs> Saturday Night Live just suddenly turns as if there's something behind him. There it was, looking down at me, and it was evil. Horrible looking down. <sighs> how do you think this came about? Oh, I know what, how it came about. I finally identified it. I happened to be, years, uh, years later, I was looking through a copy of Life magazine. I came across a picture of some forts from World War I built on, on the Marne that were used in one of the battles of the Marne. And it was what I was looking at, incredibly. It looked like the masks that the Germanic knights had on in Alexander Nevsky. If you saw Eisenstein's Nevsky, well, they had the Teutonic Knights had these mm -hmm. goddamn masks, these horrible, oh, slots for eyes, no pupils, nothing. And it was a observation cupola, a French observation cupola made out of iron with slots where they could look out and see the Germans. Mm -hmm. And my father had fought <clears throat> at the Second Battle of the Marne. He was, had been a Marine in the 5th U.S. Marines. And he'd come back after fighting in all the major battles that the American Marines fought in, which was the Second Battle of the Marne, Bella Wood, Argonne, and so on. And he came back, and then when I was a little kid, he used to show me his military equipment, including his gas, gas mask. He would put on his gas mask, and his eyes would disappear, and his face would disappear. And he would tell me about the Battle of the Marne. And I know where I got that was my father's description of the horrors that he went through. He told me about things, telling a little four-year-old child what it was like to fight in World War One. Mm. He would tell me about men with their guts blown out, and he would, sh he would show me his gun and everything. And he would tell me how they fired until their guns were red hot. I, I, I looked this up, and it's true. The American 5th Marines stopped the Germans from breaking through at, at, at Marne and uh, changed the history of the world. They were green, Americans were green troops. They had never seen battle in, in Ludendorff, the German, or Hindenburg, whichever it was, put his best men against them, seasoned German troops against green Americans. And the Americans did fire until their guns actually were too hot to hold. Mm -hmm. And my father was under gas attacks, and, and they would, he told me of the terrible fear that they would, as the charcoal and the masks would begin to become saturated with the mm -hmm. gas and mm -hmm. until they would panic and tear the masks off. And, 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 and I, these made tremendous impressions on me, you know. And my father was a big, handsome man, you know, a football player, a tennis player. And he would, he told me that those experiences, and they were unbelievable. I've read what the U.S. Marines did in that war. And, and those farm boys, which is what he was, a farm boy, those men went, un, underwent, just what Remark describes in All Quiet on the Western Front, unspeakable valor, unspeakable horrors. And he told me, his little, his little son, about that. And, and there it was, looking down at me, you know goddamn fortification, you know, mm. from, from the Marne. He may even have drawn a sketch, for all I know. He may even have had photographs, yeah. for all I know, you know, because I was real little. So did you feel that it's kind of... It made sense to fight one impression with another impression that you could get I mean, psychological sense, not, not sort of uh, theological sense, which is that, that turning to religion would just be a kind of a way of, of dealing with what you were experiencing. Yeah, today. yeah, I, I actually uh, sought uh, rescue in Christianity from what I saw in the sky, as uh, seeing what in the sky, what can, I conceived of as an evil, an evil face, an evil deity or demiurge, that I wanted the reassurance that there was a benign deity more powerful. Mm. And my priest actually said, you know, that perhaps I should become a Lutheran because I seem to actually sense the presence of Satan. Mm. And this has continued to plague me uh, as an intimation, the intimation that the God of this world is evil. Uh, it's the Gnostic belief. I mean, technically, it is it is Manichaeism or Gnosticism. Either one will do. And uh, 
in my new book that I just sent off last December to Bannon, which I worked on for five years, I try finally to come to a conscious, deliberate, intellectual assault on the problem of evil, evil carried to a transcendent level, evil deified. Face that which the Buddha faced, you know, where the Buddha, seeing the evil of the world, suffering the evil of the world, came to the conclusion there could be no creator God. Because if there were, it could not be this way. So much evil, so much suffering. Mm. And I had come to an even worse conclusion. I had come to the conclusion that there was a, a deity of this world, and he was evil. And this was something I just simply could not escape from. And I had formulated the problem again and again in books like Maze of Death and Ubik and Three Stigmata, you know, and Eye in the Sky. And the, the, the essential problem, as I, as I construed it in, into the 70s, looking back through my thinking and writing of 25 years, was that the divinity, the divine power that I perceived as master of this world was either cruel, wanton, blind, insensible, destructive, or evil. Um... I don't know. Is this relevant? Are you interested in this? Is it relevant? I think it's 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 absolutely fascinating. Okay, I'm very moved too. That I had seen in the world what the Buddha saw: pointless suffering, suffering of animals, suffering of people, suffering of nations. I mean, I. I remember during World War II when I was a kid seeing film in the theater, newsreel film, of a Japanese soldier who had been hit with you know, a flamethrower by the Americans. burning. He was burning to death and running and burning and running and burning and running. And I had seen a kid burn up in camp when I was in grammar school. And the audience seeing this Japanese soldier burning to death and running, just a flaming torch, cheered and laughed. And I, I was dazed with horror at the sight of the man on the screen burning to death, dazed with horror at the audience's reaction. And, you know, I was just a kid. And I thought, what, what is wrong? Something terrible is wrong. Something terrible is wrong. And years later when I was an adult, when I was, say, 20, one time in the country when I was going to be a counselor at a, at a children's camp, um, I got out of a car and found a huge field mouse that had been run over by the car, and it was crushed just into jelly, and it was still alive, and it was looked up into my face with its dying eyes, and it looked at me, and I looked at it, and I could not tell what it felt logically. I mean, I can't really say I know what was going on in that, that creature's mind, but I saw in its eyes horror and what had happened to it, beyond the capacity of words to describe. And then uh, later, and when I was in my 30s and living in the country, um, I had, I'd had to kill a rat that had gotten into the children's bedroom. And I had, rats are hard to kill. And I had set a trap for it, and the, in the night it got into the trap, and the traps closed and the next morning I got up, and when it heard me come, it screamed. And I w went out, took the trap out with, with a pitchfork, and spr sprung the trap to let the rat go, to release the rat out in the pasture. And it came out of the trap, and its neck was still alive. And I took the pitchfork and drove the tines of the pitchfork into the rat, and it didn't die. And at that point, I was, I just simply went crazy with horror. And I ran in and filled the tub with water and drowned it. Here was this rat. It was poisoned. His neck was broken. He was stabbed with a tine of a pitchfork, and he was still alive. And I buried him, and I took my sink 
Christopher's medal that I wore, and I buried the St. Christopher's medal with the rat. And that soul of that rat, I carried on me from then on as, an, as a question and, and as a problem about the condition of the living creature on this world. Yet the rat had come into the house to get food, and it had suffered a terrible death, and it was terrified of me. And I would have let it go if I could have let it go. And yet I had had to kill that rat, and yet that rat had tried only to come in and get food. It was all it was motivated to do. And the, the, this is what led the Buddha to conclude that there was no creator. Okay, so much for that. Uh, in, in 74, 1974, living down here in Orange County, I was suffering. Now, if, I, if this is not relevant, you tell me. Oh, this, okay. this is absolutely central. I, I, I in, in my novel, Flow My Tears, a policeman said, the dying rat, the rat screaming, shows up in the dream where the armed posse is approaching the building and Jason Taverner is hiding in the building and hearing the posse coming he screams, he's shut up in the dark and that is that rat screaming when it hears me coming that dream, even in 74 I was still remembering that rat screaming was that I could not exorcise the ghost of the spirit of that rat which had died so horribly and which I couldn't, eyes tormentor could not save even though I wanted to save it um I mean, I had I had uh, seen animals that had been poisoned with rat poison, hemorrhaging and dying, bleeding, looking up at me, and I, you know, I had had to hold a lamb while a veterinarian killed it. I had held sheep while their throats were cut. I had finally become half crazed with horror and grief at the at the state of the world. I was looking for some enlightenment, so. In 74, there came upon me at the trough of my life, at the point where I saw nothing but inexplicable suffering, there came to me the beatific vision, which calmed all my sense of horror at the world, and my sense of the transcendent power of evil. And on the basis of this vision, we're speaking now of a time slightly over five years ago, just a bit over five years ago, I set out to write a book in which this was expressed in a in a way that made rational sense rather than simply mystical sense, that my mystical experience with the beatific vision had to be formulated into some rational structure that could be transferred to other people. What did this amount to philosophically? Um, My mental anguish was simply removed from me, you know, as if by a divine fiat, you know, that God... This just happened to you on your own? Yes. No one else in- yes, it just happened to me on my own. Um, it was as if the primordial curse or fall had lifted from me, you know, and that I was restored, healed. It was a sort of, you know, uh, intervention of a kind of a psychological, mystical type, which I described in Valus, my new book, what is it called? VALIS, V-A-L-I-S. It stands for Vast Active Living Intelligence System. Mm-hmm. What happened was that some transcendent divine power, which was not evil but was benign, intervened to restore my mind, to heal, heal my mind and heal my body and give me a sense of the beauty of the world, the joy of the world, the the sanity of the world. And out of this, I forged a concept which is relatively simple. 
and possibly unique in theology. And that is the basis of my insight, and it took me four and a half years to formulate it after this experience, is that the irrational is the primordial stratum of the universe. It comes first in time, and it is primary in ontology, in, in levels of, of, of essence. And it evolves from irrationality, chaos, and blindness <clears throat> into rationality. That is, the irrational gives birth to the rational. And that the history of the universe is a movement from irrationality, which means chaos, cruelty, blindness, pointlessness, generates evolutionarily a rational structure which is harmonious, which interlocks, which, which is interlinked in a, in a way where it is orderly and beautiful and harmonious. But that the, this comes into existence only fitfully, slowly, sporadically, uh, like lightning discharges here and there, that it's not ubiquitous, as I supposed in the novel Ubik, that it's, it's, um, it's found in, in Jewish mysticism as it's called the Shekinah, which means divine presence. And the theory is that it's only intermittent and, and from time to time and from place to place. Now, I conceived of it as evolving out of the irrational, that the, that the primordial creator deity, the way, I, the way I express it, Vels, is the primordial creator deity was essentially deranged from our standpoint, that we are, as humans, a, an evolution above the primordial deity. Mm -hmm. We actually stand, it is somebody in the Middle Ages once said, we are pygmies, but we stand on the shoulders of giants, and therefore we see more than they see. We human beings are created, and yet we are more rational than the creator himself, who, mm. who spawned us. Oh, wonderful idea. Yeah, and the, the whole evolution of, of, the, of the cosmos is away from blindness, destructiveness, and, and the, the pointless clashing together. Mm toward a coherency and a, and a harmonious interrelationship. And so, in the way, I guess Tilhard de Chardin would be the, the, one of the few people, you know, that, that had this vision where he talks about point omega toward which we're evolving. But I see the, the, the rational and benign divine power as a late development in the history of the universe, not as the creator, but as coming onto the scene, finding chaos, finding irrationality, and beginning to organize it into a, a cosmos. And that in a sense, there is a kind of conflict between these two deities or principles. They could be regarded as the principle of disorder versus the principle of order. But the primary condition of, of reality is disorder. And out of disorder, order forms. It, it, the universe moves from disorder to order. And disorder I equate with evil, and order I equate with, with, with the benign. Mm. So what I, what I stipulate in vows is, put dramatically this way, the rational bursts into the irrational invades it, subdues it, and sobers the landscape. Can we go on a little longer? I just got to put another... Sure, for sure. This is a couple of minutes. I mean, the more you say, the more I think of us. I didn't mean to pontificate on and on like that. What immediately comes to mind um, listening to this is the difference between your worldview and mine, and that is, of course, that 
never having had any <coughs> to me any any good reason to to believe in anything more than sort of the everyday reality under my fingertips. Um, my article of faith, and I do see it as an article of faith, is that there is just total randomness in the world, unrelieved by any higher force or system. And um, I find it much easier to see things as being resulting from all these these sort of easy laws like uh, you know, the law of DNA, the law of evolution, all of all of these rather facile ex explanations for that, rather than attach any greater significance to things. Now, I assume that this outlook is rather opposed to. My outlook is based on not on faith, but on an actual that the actual encounter that I had in '74 with a mysterious, powerful, rational mind, which was unfathomable to me as to what it was, for what it called itself. It seemed to resemble Ubik to in many respects. Ubik, the entity that I had written about in the novel by the title. When you say an encounter, was, was this um, a, a sort of hallucination or a vision or something? It was an invasion of my mind hmm. by a transcendently rational mind. It was almost as if I had been insane all my life, and suddenly I had become sane. Now, I've actually thought of that as, as a possibility, that I, that I actually have been psychotic until 1974, from 1928 when I was born until, 19, until March of 1974. But I don't think that's the case. I mean, I may have been somewhat whacked out, you know, and somewhat eccentric for years and years and years. But I wasn't all that crazy, because I'd been given Rorschach tests and so on. This was a rational mind that was not a human rational mind. It was, it was more like an artificial intelligence. Now, I don't pretend to know what it was. On Thursdays and Saturdays, I think it was God. On Tuesdays and Wednesdays, I think that it was extraterrestrials. Sometimes I think it's, it was the Soviet Union, the Academy of Sciences, was trying out their, their psych, psychotronic microwave, telepathic trans... I thought about that. I tried different theories, you know. Yeah. I, mean, I, I tried every theory. I thought of the Rosicrucians. I thought of the Russians. <laughs> I thought of extraterrestrials. I thought of God. I thought of Christ. Was this something you heard then? Or, or was it more than... Well, it... it, it <laughs> the experience. Uh, it, um, it invaded my mind and assumed control of my motor centers and did my acting and thinking for me. But you had your own consciousness there as well. Yeah, but I was a spectator to it. Oh. And it, first of all, it set about healing me physically and my little boy, my little four-year-old boy had a birth, undiagnosed birth defect. And this, this mind, which, uh, whose identity was totally obscure to me, I even thought it might have been Elijah, it might have been the Holy Spirit. I, I thought of everything. I, I, all I can say is I don't know was that it was equipped with, with tremendous technical knowledge, engineering knowledge, medical knowledge, cosmo, cosmological knowledge, philosophical knowledge. Um, the first thing that it informed me was to be very wary of heavy metals. And I've even thought that it was one of the great Illuminati of history, one of the great Rosicrucians, like it might have been Par Paracelsus, I thought, I thought for a long time that it might have been Paracelsus. I thought it might be a previous incarnation of myself that had broken through. It had memories. It had memories dating back over 2,000 years. It spoke Greek. It spoke Hebrew. It spoke Sanskrit. There wasn't anything that it didn't seem to know. It uh, immediately set about putting my affairs in order. 
It fired my agent. It fired my publisher. <laughs> Uh, it, it was very practical. It decided that the, the apartment had not been vacuumed adequately and not recently enough. It decided that I should stop drinking wine entirely because uh, of the sediment. And it turned out I had uh, abundance of uric acid in my system and switched me to beer. Um, it made elementary mistakes. It kept calling the dog he and the cat she, which annoyed my wife since I knew and she knew that the dog was a female and the cat was a male. It kept re kept calling her ma'am, uh, and it would lapse into, into what turned out to be Koine Greek uh, when it would fall into a, co a contemplative state. Uh, she recognized it as Koine Greek because she'd taken some Attic Greek in, in, uh, in school. I didn't even recognize it as a language. I thought they were just, it was just nonsense. Um, it was very intelligent and had a firm and shrewd grasp of business matters. It remarked into my typewriter's <laughs> margining. Um, I even thought it might have been the soul of, of my friend Jim Pike come back from the dead. And I'm, I don't exclude a possibility either. Uh, Charles, I'm not willing to exclude the possibility that Jim Pike came back to me as his son Jimmy came back to him, because it had a tremendous interest in early Christian theology and in Zoroastrianism, which Jim Pike had confessed to me once he believed was probably the true religion. It was very versed in Zoroastrianism and knew a great deal about the Essenes and the therapeutic. How did your wife perceive all this? Did you tell her what was going on? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, we discussed it. Um, she was impressed by the fact that because of the tremendous pressure that it put on, on people in my business that I made quite a lot of money very rapidly. We began to get checks in for thousands of dollars, money that was owed me, that this mind was conscious existed in New York and had never been coughed up. Um, it also wrote a letter to the, Roman, to the Roman Catholic Church informing the Roman Catholic Church that my writing contained uh, allusions to the New Testament, which were to edify the Roman Catholic Church that a miracle had occurred and uh, it was very busy and active. Um, does this interest you? I put it up. Okay. Uh, it had one overweening concern. This was in uh, March of 1970. It informed me that a group of conspirators had murdered the Kennedys, Dr. King, and Bishop Pike. That it, the mind that had taken me over, had seen the conspirators. The mind then graphically represented itself as the Kumean civil. What's the what? The civil of Kumean. Oh, I, I'm my. Logical knowledge is not very well. The Kumean civil was the Roman equivalent of the Delphic civil of Greece. Oh. It, uh, the Kumean civil advised the Roman Republic when it was in danger. She had the so called Sibylline books, which were consulted by the uh, Roman Republic. Oh, I see. I see. Uh, she Well, now I've let it out of the bag, haven't I? I said she. It was female. She was female. She had the Sibylline books. She showed me the Sibylline books. She said the Republic was in danger. She meant the American Republic. She said that once again the Empire threatened to take over. She was there to see that the empire was destroyed. I shouldn't be saying this. This is really stupid of me, Charles. I shouldn't be talking I'll about it. I'll cut out anything that you want me to No, say. I don't approve of that. I mean, if I'm indiscreet enough to say it, I don't necessarily want to sense, censor it. Well, wait a minute. I don't see it that way. I see it as uh, sometimes you need to think carefully as to what you want to make public and what you don't. And you can't think carefully at the same time that you're talking. Well, that's true. That's true. So I, you know. Well, okay, most of it's in balance. She said that the oscillation between the Republic and the Empire 
was a constant in history. She caused me to see periods in history in which the empire had been defeated. It took me five years to identify one of those periods. It turned out to be the War of the Spanish Lowlands. It turned out to be the beginning of the 17th century in which the, the Dutch cities broke off from the Holy Roman Empire. She said that that was the situation now in the United States in 74, that the Republic was turning into an empire. And she said, and they shall be destroyed, for they are murderers. Um, she then dictated a series of letters to Charles Wiggins. Charles Wiggins was on the House Judiciary Committee sitting in on the decision as to whether to impeach President Nixon. She said to inform she would dictate the letters. She dictated a series of letters to Congressman Wiggins. They dealt with constitutional law. I didn't understand the letters. Because they dealt with constitutional law and nothing about constitutional law. Later I found out that, that Congressman Wiggins is, is such an authority on constitutional law that he was uh, suggested as a possibility for the Supreme Court. He came from Fullerton, which is where I was living in his practice to read every letter that came from Fullerton and to answer it. She revealed to me that she had moved me to Fullerton from Canada so that I could write to Charles Wiggins on the Judiciary Committee while they were sitting in judgment on whether they should vote out a bill of impeachment on President Nixon. She dictated a series of letters informing Congressman Wiggins that he had no loyalty to the President of the United States because the President had violated his oath of office, which was that he would uphold the Constitution of the United States. He had failed to do so. Charles Wiggins did not owe the President any loyalty, citing historical examples. Congressman Wiggins answered each letter in detail, and then she sent the final letter. The letter contained the information of the Nixon transcripts with forgeries. They did not correspond to the next to the tapes. And if the tapes were released, it would show that the transcripts were forgeries. That letter she sent to the um, Wall Street Journal, which had published an editorial saying that the, for, the uh, transcripts showed that Nixon was innocent and that we should believe him when he said that they corresponded to the tapes. She stated that the transcripts were self-serving, were not evidentiary, and that the tapes would show that the forgeries, that the transcripts were forgeries, and at that point she wound down her mission. But by that time she had gotten me to the doctor, she had had me diagnosed, found a number of physical ailments that I had. My little boy had gone in for surgery and had his birth defect repaired, which was a life-threatening birth defect. It could have killed him at any time. She did everything but paper the walls of the apartment. Um, she told me about the article that would be coming out in Rolling Stone by Paul Williams. She told me that it would change my life. What was it? The, the article in Rolling Stone by Paul Williams about me. Oh, that one. Yeah. yeah she she yes. told me that would be coming out. My, she said your friend Paul. She showed me the article yeah. and said your friend Paul will be doing an article about your troubles in Warren County. Mm -hmm. yeah, at that point, Paul hadn't said to me anything about she also said that she would stay on as my tutelary spirit. I had to look up tutelary in my mouth. She had the unfortunate habit of lapsing into Greek. And then, having healed me, calmed me, she presented me with the beatific vision. She showed me a garden of such beauty that I could not believe it existed. And I walked around in it. I was actually in it. She transformed the landscape for me. Palm trees, beauty of indescribable beauty, just indescribable beauty. And she said, when you get old and are dying, 
I will come back for you and take you there. But she said, I will not come back until then. She said, I got my, she says, I have to leave now. So, I don't know who she was. She appeared as Aphrodite at one point. Uh, <clears throat> at one time, I said, uh, who are you? Who are you? Tell me who you are, for God's sake. Tell me who you are. And she said, think of me as Diana. <laughs> she said, the She said, for me, everything is permitted. She, Diana turned, looked up Diana. She turns out she was the Roman patron, God, patroness of slaves. She was loved by the lower class. Uh, in addition to all these things, she solved a problem facing me, which was of such gravity that it probably was the greatest crisis of my life. Uh, at that point, she described herself as, as the holy wisdom and applied the powers of holy wisdom to the problem. But at, at another time, she described herself as the spirit of Erasmus. Uh, and finally she said that she was essentially playing a game, that she loved to play games, and that none of the things she described about herself, her identity, were, were correct, that, that, she, that I would never know who she was. That she, 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 I heard the beautiful bells in the distance, and, and whenever, the most beautiful bell. But she finally said that, she, that I would never know who she was. You know, a lot of people, if anyone heard this transcript, which uh, as far as I'm concerned, they won't because I regard this as a very special conversation, um, they would think you were putting me on. I can hear Norman spin around. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, I've, I've taken notes on this, and I have almost 500,000 words of notes that I've taken. Um, when, when, when Ballas comes out, see, probably by the time your interview comes out, Ballas will have come out. And, well, what's the publication? Uh, they haven't set a date. They're trying to get a hardcover of the song and it's hardcover of the uh, This book is vaguely scheduled for May of 70, of, of 80. Well, it, it, it's... Not me. It's hard for me to say, because yeah. Bannon can publish real fast. Mm -hmm. uh, I wrote a lot of it up in Ballas. Uh, but is Ballas then a novel or, or a mixture? It's a mixture of autobiography, fiction, mm -hmm. and dramatic devices from the uh, modern theater. From Carandolo and the Perry. I did enough to read it. I don't pretend to know who she was. Uh, she said conflicting things. Uh, I have, I spend between four and eight hours a day doing research in, in history to find where anybody's had an experience like this. I can't find an example. Uh, I just keep seeing you as, as being uh, a natural focus for some strange new religions. She, uh, at one point, I was convinced that I was dealing with a computer. I said, would you tell me where you are? I said, all right, I'll tell you. I'll, I'll make a deal. Will you tell me where you are? She said, I'm in the Portuguese states of America. I said, there are no Portuguese states of America. <laughs> but she, she was able to solve intricate problems that I was facing. She loved puzzles. She still loves puzzles. She loves puzzles. And she, she was fascinated by a puzzle. A uh, crisis for me it was a serious crisis. It was a puzzle involving my Annie 
war activities and my political affiliations. Uh, she saw in it, I think, a chance to solve a puzzle that was a Chinese finger trap. The harder you tried to solve it, the mm. further away you got. And she saw an opportunity to. This. I, I'm, I'm really convinced that her love of puzzles was was just too much. She couldn't read this. I'm reminded suddenly of that that um, well series of events in We Can Build You where Mr. Lincoln keeps. So I had to write a book about this, and I just construed her as the as a rational mind breaking into mm. the irrational universe. So I call her vast, active, living intelligence, mm. which is a description, a simple description. Of she's vast, active, living intelligence. She's an organized system. Mm. And uh, do you recognize the possibility? However remote, that that you could have, in some way, been talking to yourself. That in, in some way you could have known everything that she knew. Yes, it could have been a dialogue between the two hemispheres of my brain, as we find in Scanner Dark. Mm -hmm. There was my right hemisphere. It could have been a a, a second uh, ecosystem, a second self system in my head. Would you prefer not to believe? Um. Uh, This was suggested to me by at least one person, mm -hmm. and certainly Scanner, which had already been written, yes. I had already written Scanner, although I hadn't published it, suggests that I have two cycloid, two psyches in my mm -hmm. one each in each hemisphere, mm -hmm. and the right hemisphere personality broke through, mm -hmm. and it's the anima, a Jungian term, my anima, an anima. Mm -hmm. But there's only one thing that, that, that there's one thing that, that happened which, which when I think that when when I think to myself I have another personality and that was it is that um, she interfered with the sequence of causal of causal events mm -hmm. in, in my environment. Mm -hmm. She was actually present as an extra or appeared present appeared present. Now she may not have been. It may have been a projection. Uh, from my own mind, under, under my reality, under my environment. But I mean, the cases that I've read of, of multiple personalities. Well, I, I think it's a good possibility. The, the only thing is that she was armed with ferocious knowledge. Uh, that, of course, is, is the part which is so fascinating. She, she, and she was, I mean, she was so shrewd, and she continued to. She had she had first spoken to me in high school uh, during a physics test in the eleventh grade. I wasn't able to solve any of the uh, of the ten questions. Eight dealt with or were based on Archimedes' principle, and I didn't know the principle, so I couldn't solve the eight questions mm -hmm. of the ten. And all of a sudden, uh, her voice cut in, and she said she defined our she, she explained Archimedes' principle to me. She she explained the principle in theory, and then she showed the application. One of the eight questions, and I said, "Well, now I'll test this out and see if there's anything to this by by examining the grades that I got." And of the ten questions, one was wrong, and it was one of the first two yeah. which I had done. And all eight that she had done were correct. I got an A on the test and an A. In the Are you now saying then that this is a voice which has broken through to you over the years? Just two times before oh, then, and once in the sixth. And also, she had put a great deal of material in my novel, which she was very proud of. She was not reticent about that. <laughs> she drew my attention to material. She had put Ubik, Flow My Tears, Faith of Our Fathers. You know, there is nothing that I like better than, than to have my worldview uh, shaken up. She said to me, the last thing she said to me was last week, she said to me, for the first time, she used the word I, speaking of herself. She said, I make moves which you do not understand. And I knew you know, that, that she would always elude me, and that she knew she would always elude me, and she knew I would always try to understand her. Did she tell you anything about 
talking about this? She told me two things in order to tell. Oh. <laughs> so I, I inferred from that that I was, it was all right to tell the rest. Oh. No, I just wondered if she sort of said, when someone turns up with a tape recorder, <laughs> do this. She told me two things. As I say, I just inferred it was all right. But I'm, I'm quite reticent mm. about this. I do not. I've talked to my priest about it. Mm. And I've talked to a couple of close friends, and of course my ex-wife knows about it. And um, several people that I correspond with, I've, I've discussed it. And I tried to discuss it with Ursula Le Guin, and she just wrote and said, I think you're crazy. And sent back the... the, the I sent her some material, she mailed it back and said, I think you're crazy. So that, that of course, you know, I didn't tend yeah. to discuss it very much, but yeah. uh, when Valis comes out, you know, a lot of it's going to be Valis. Yeah. I'm less reticent than I was. Yeah. But uh, yeah. this is five, we're talking about five years, and we're talking about an entity which had spoken to me in high school in the 60s, and who also has saturated my life with, with uh, pre-Socratic philosophy. I remember in 74 I was being interviewed by a French guy who was doing his dissertation for the French you know, PhD, and he asked me about the Empedoclean philosophy in the Ubik, and I said I had never read Empedocles, and he got so angry that he, although he'd flown all the way from France to interview me, he got up and left. He said, you're a liar. He said, you've got whole sections of Empedocles. And I later read, read Empedocles, and he was correct. But she was an authority on, on Greek philosophy. That was her speciality. She loved that, all the, the uh, Heraclitus and uh, Xenophanes and Parmenides. She loved the paradoxes of Zeno, but she disapproved of his arguing. Any point she disapproved of the sophists. She highly disapproved of the sophists. But she showed me the Sibylline books. They were really something. In the Sibylline books was listed the entire history of human civilization. She didn't show me all. Oh my God, <laughs> she just showed me passages here and there. I have more than I can cope with. Oh dear. <laughs> I've wrecked your whole trip to Calvin. No, no, no. You've enriched it. Oh, she told me what was damaging the, the people's brains up there on the, on the drug. Uh, mercury. Because tra traces of mercury. Where? What, what do you mean specifically? Uh, in the Bay Area. Remember the Bay I said Area. That yeah. this yeah. brain dysfunction? She yeah. said it was mercury, it was bichloride yeah. of mercury. She specifically said by chloride. And by the way, I didn't know that by chloride was by chloride of mercury. She just said by chloride. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I found out later that it was by chloride of mercury. Yeah. And she also referred to mercury orally taken later. Specifically, she said aspirin of mercury. She was always very cryptic. She forced me to go to reference books. But aspirin of mercury would be mercury taken orally, she said, as a medicine. As, as a pill. Trace amounts of heavy metals in the drugs that we were being yeah. distributed in the streets. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe have a different description of this because it's given what else is in the drug communities. No, that's not the thing. Well, you know, Burroughs' theory is that junkies are really addicts of heavy metals. Really? That the thing they're looking for in the heroin, the body is searching for is the heavy metals. That's that's the real addictive part of it. But yeah, that's William Burroughs' theory. Right. I'm, I'm going to turn this thing off.